Well, thank you very much, Steve. And thank you everybody for joining us this morning. In case you didn't realize it, this is a First World War talk. Now, I'm not a First World War historian, but you don't need to be First World War experts either. If you can think, oh, 1915 Gallipoli, 1916 the Somme, 1917 the Russians crash out. If you can think at that sort of level, you'll be fine. OK, um, now, how did this come about? Well, I saw, I was shown photographs of four of the letters that will be mentioned in the course of the talk. And I thought, these are amazing. And you know, people will want to know about this. You people will want to know about this. And then I realized that if I wanted something doing, I needed to do it myself. So even though I have no expertise in the relevant period, I've given the thing a shot. And now I can take you with me on a recreation of the journey that I've been on. However, if your minds wander in the course of what follows, you might like to think of other affectionate corruptions of Le Carré titles. This being a downside related talk, there will be schoolboys in it. So we must hope that they were honorable. And if you get to a small town in Switzerland, well, I beat you to it. Now, we have a wide variety of people here today some historians, some non-historians, some people who know downside better than I do, and some people who have never been there at all. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is what it looks like. Uh, yes, um, so this is, Steve is doing the, the slides and he should have a little arrow for us. Thank you. And he is going to show us the Abbey Church with its tower that can be seen for miles around in the Somerset countryside. There we are, the tower, the Abbey Church with the, uh, uh, the choir off to one side of the tower, the nave off to the other, yes. And on the nave side, you can see the monastery itself. That is where Abbot Ford lived for most of his time at Downside. Opposite the monastery, there is a building that Abbot Ford did not see. That's the 20th century guest wing and connected to that, a very, very concrete building, and connected to that is the library, which is where I assume Steve is at the moment. And um, many of you I know are familiar with that. All the other buildings coming further forward form the school. And the whole group was centered on an original farmhouse. Oh yes, there it is, the old house as it's now known. And uh, that was part of what, uh, the first place that Ford uh, presumably lived and knew. Right, um, when Hugh Ford became a pupil in the school in 1861, it looked more like this. Speed up, Steve, more like this. That's the, there you've got the old house, but point your arrow to it, Steve. No, he's not pointing. Yes, there he is. And, and then the buildings that came along after that in the um, early to mid 19th century. Put your fingers over the tower in the background because that was not there when Ford joined the school in 1861. He was born in the Clifton area of Bristol to a cradle Catholic mother and a convert father. Now, the school at Downside was then small enough for it to be something of a second family to him. And there's a very easy statistic for you at this point. In 1875, there were 75 pupils in the school. So when Ford was a pupil in the 1860s, it must have been smaller still. As a schoolboy, Hugh, as he was then known, was noted for his prim appearance his courteous manner, his musical talent, his debating skill, and his quiet command of a range of subjects across the curriculum. In 1868, he entered the monastery, so he didn't have to go far, um, all in the same set of buildings. And at that point, he took the monastic name of Edmund. I suppose he was supposed to have 
a stable life, take a vow of stability, but his monastic career was not particularly stable. In the mid 1870s, he went on a three year trip to Australia, the purpose of which was to toughen his weak physical constitution. We will keep hearing about Ford's weak physical constitution. It needed a lot of toughening. Um, but three years in Australia um, did, for, uh, did him for a while. During his absence in the Antipodes, a purpose-built monastery was constructed. Um, and here again, you have to put your fingers over the tower that looms above it. So in the foreground, you've got uh, the monastery that existed. Once, yes, there it is. Once Ford came back from Australia, that is where he lived from that point onwards. But the building of the new monastery was only part of a much more ambitious whole, for a large church was also planned. In 1878, Downside was still a priory, and a new prior was chosen. That was Dom Aidan Gasquet. Um, Gasquet had been prefect of studies in the school till that point, and Ford who was very much Gasquet's sidekick, took over that role in the school. So he had plenty of experience as a teacher. Once Gasquet was the superior of this house, building work proceeded apace. And here you can see the foot of what became that tall tower, and the photograph was taken about 1881. Gasquet ensured that the whole church was so large that his successors would be obliged to continue building on the same massive scale. Now, the tower, the foot of which you see there, is on an axis with the transept, which was opened in 1882 and served as the community's place of worship until the choir was built. So I've put that one up because you can imagine that was where Ford spent a lot of his time from 1882 onwards um, and, and including his period as prior of downside. So that was the monastic church for much of his time there. Now, extended travel for the sake of his health remained a feature of Ford's monastic life, though his next expedition was conventional enough. For in 1884 to five, he undertook studies in Rome. His academic interests were wide ranging and included both patristics and canon law. Within the downside community, he was regarded as something of a, a serious intellectual. He was certainly regarded as a competent manager of money and a natural leader. So that when Gasquet resigned as prior in 1885, Ford was chosen to complete his eight year term of office or what would have been an eight year term of office. He also succeeded Gasquet as leader of a reforming group within the community and in the English Benedictine congregation more generally. But in 1888 to nine, that group um, sort of fell out of favor and the internal politics of the congregation obliged him to live in premature retirement at Little Malvern in Worcestershire, after which he served as parish priest of Beckles in East Anglia. But in 1894, the pendulum swung again and the community elected him as their prior. There followed what I think of as Ford's heroic phase. As prior rather than as abbot, he had very clear ideas about what English Catholic worship should be like and what an English Catholic church should look like and sound like. For the look like, he called in Ninian Comper, who was commissioned to provide various uh, decorative uh, embellishments for the Lady Chapel and other chapels uh, around the east end of the, uh, of the church. And for what an English church should sound like, he appointed Richard Terry as organist and director of music. And for those of you who know me from the world of Renaissance studies, this is where the overlap comes in. For Terry pioneered the revival of early music for liturgical use. 
Such was the numerical health of the community at this stage that the monastery building was extended in 1899 to 1900. But only after Downside had assumed responsibility for the parish at Ealing in West London, where an offshoot of the community was established. So they'd got enough members to have this offshoot in Ealing. So it's all going really rather well. Meanwhile, Gasquet was increasingly influential in Rome. So it was no coincidence that the three existing houses of the congregation, because Ealing didn't become an abbey until later on, um, Downside, Ampleforth and Dowie were raised to abbatial status in 1899. Now, just as a priory is headed by a prior, so an abbey is headed by an abbot. And in 1900, Ford was elected as the first abbot of Downside. Though note in this photograph that pride of place goes to Gasquet, the older figure, uh, sort of stockier figure in the middle of the front row, who surely regarded himself as the power behind the abbatial throne. Again, for Ford's period as abbot, we can look to the architecture as a measure of his achievements. The bell in that huge tower, Great Bead, was hung in 1903, and Thomas Garner's choir was completed in 1905. Here is the choir under construction, and what you can see on the left is Gasquet's legacy to his successors saying, I've built one bay of the nave. That, yes, there's the arrow pointing to it. I've built one bay of the nave. That is how tall it's supposed to be. That is how wide it's supposed to be. And, and of course, if the nave was to have those dimensions, then the choir could hardly be any, uh, any, any lower, any smaller. Um, so there you can see the construction of the choir filling the gap between the transept that we saw before and the lady chapel at the other end that already existed. Now here is the choir in 1905 when it was completed to Thomas Garner's design. So those of you who know Downside know that uh, Comper then uh, late, sometime later added the stained glass window uh, which was Ah, yes, it's there. Um, here's the choir as it is now, with the 1930s choir stalls, which Ford did not live to see. Now, the choir being the heart of a monastic church, this rather confirmed Ford's reputation as the maker of modern downside, though his influence went as far as the gardens as well, which were also laid out largely to his design. After three quarters of his eight year term had passed, he resigned on the grounds of poor health, becoming the titular abbot of nearby Glastonbury. He was only 55, which is sobering because that's younger than I am and I've hardly started and he'd finished at 55. For some years thereafter, he divided his time between Ealing, where he served as superior, and traveling in Southern Europe. This quasi invalid survived to the age of 79, he died at Downside in 1930 and was buried in the Abbey Church. Ford's biography was written by Dom Bruno Hicks, the fifth abbot, and it was published in 1947. Uh, this, this is it. And if uh, the community at Ealing want it back again, this is clearly their copy, but I think it was purchased fair and square from Mr. Amazon. And for Hicks's biography tells of Ford as teacher, builder and abbot, which means that I need say no more about those. But thanks to Downside's recent collaboration with the University of Bristol, and in particular to the cataloguing of Ford's papers by Alice Morrie, we can now add another side to Ford's later career. Photographs and postcards in the collection illustrate his closeness to family members and his love of travel, while newspaper cuttings confirm his interest in current affairs. But more striking are two passports issued in 1915 and 1918, together with a travel journal kept on the latter occasion. Alongside these items, 
correspondence dating from 1915 to 1921 reveals that Ford enjoyed close contact with diplomats at the Foreign Office in London and was employed by them as a wartime agent. The serene and scholarly manner of an aging monk providing the perfect cover for clandestine activities. Now, let us remind ourselves, if we need to, about the Catholic dimension of the First World War. Although Britain in 1914 was the most obviously global of the major powers, the onset of war brought out the nation's latent xenophobia, and it doesn't take much to do that, does it? It was a phenomenon long infused with broad anti-Catholicism and more specific anti-papalism. Pope Benedict XV was swiftly accused in the British press of being pro-German, a label that proved difficult to shift amid the heightened emotions of war. In reality, Benedict sought to be an even-handed pastor to his warring children, championing the cause of peace, most obviously in his peace note of the 1st of August, 1917. But it did not follow that those clerics immediately beneath him in the hierarchy were similarly detached. Patriotic cardinals and bishops could be found in each of the belligerent nations. In the case of Britain, that meant Cardinal Bourne, the Archbishop of Westminster, but it also meant Gasquet, who we see here, who had been raised to the Cardinalate only two months before the outbreak of hostilities. There was some hostility between Bourne and Gasquet, and it was seen, as anyone who has read about Catholic chaplains during the war, it was seen in, with regard to the cure of Catholic souls in the armed forces. We could talk more about it later, but it was Gasquet's will that prevailed. And in 1917, the Holy See appointed a bishop to the British Armed Forces. The man chosen was William Keating, a secular priest, but a former downside pupil. As you know, most of the action was on the Western Front, where the principal Catholic chaplain was Stephen Rawlinson, uh, could we have the arrow on Steve? There he is. Um, that's Stephen Rawlinson back in 1888. And he's sitting behind, yes, Edmund Ford. So that's a nice little um, image there. Rawlinson's sidekick, his second in command on the Western Front, was also a downside monk, Dominic Young. But he's not in that picture. He was somewhat younger, appropriately. Now, you may safely conclude that all these people got into all these positions because of Gasquet, because he could pull strings in both church and state. Let us have a few more words about him for a moment. Since 1907, Gasquet had resided in Rome, where he was chairman of the Vulgate Commission. At the outbreak of war in 1914, his Roman residence was St. Anselmo, the International House of Studies on the Aventine, established by Leo XIII as a means of bringing together the otherwise disparate and distinctive Benedictine congregations, Subiaco, Solem, Boiron, and so forth, with its abbot serving as primate of the entire Benedictine confederation. And I'm glad to say that uh, Dom Anselm is with us this morning because he once took me onto the roof at St Anselmo, um, which turned out to be a very popular place for sunbathing. But that is by the by. Now, so it was designed to bring together all these different uh, congregations um, into one confederation. But however international the character of Benedictine monasticism, as a whole, St. Anselmo quickly acquired a markedly German character, reflected in the fact that the first two abbots primate, Hildebrand de Hemptine and Fidelis von Stotzingen, were both monks of Beuren in southwestern Germany. The Italian authorities regarded Stotzingen as a friend of the Kaiser and the community at St. Anselmo as a nest of Tedeschi Germans. Gasquet felt so uncomfortable there that he crossed the Tiber and took up residence in the Palazzo San Calisto in Trastevere. 
the strength of the central powers, Austria, Hungary, Germany, in Papal Rome was not confined to Sant'Anselmo, for there was also a clear diplomatic imbalance between Austria, Bavaria and Prussia on the one hand, all of which maintained ambassadors to the Holy See, and their enemies, who were collectively represented by no more than an elderly Belgian ambassador and an undistinguished Russian one. In 1914 to 15, the sense of German diplomatic superiority in Rome was compounded by the fact that Wilhelm II's ambassador to the Kingdom of Italy was the former German Chancellor Bernhard von Bülow, who lived with his Italian wife in the palatial Villa Malta behind Santa Trinita dei Monti and he was called out of retirement as dis Europe descended into war. Bulow's British counterpart was Sir Renal Rod, a man with co uh, considerable Roman experience. I think one can quite easily get distracted by Rod's story, but we mustn't at this point. Rod had no accreditation to the Vatican because the two systems of uh, ambassadors to the Kingdom of Italy and ambassadors to the Holy See were completely separate. So that left a diplomatic vacuum, which Gasquet sought to fill by proposing the creation of a British mission to the Holy See and recommending the appointment of Sir Henry Howard as its head. Howard was an old downside boy whose diplomatic career had peaked in 1896 when he was appointed as ambassador to The Hague and Luxembourg. So the British mission was in operation by the end of uh, 1914 but Howard retired again in 1916, and the head of mission from that point onwards was John Count de Salis, of whom we shall hear more, and uh, we'll see him later as well. Wartime Rome offered countless opportunities for propaganda, espionage, and all manner of covert activities, not least through the notoriously porous walls of the Vatican. If Allied suspicions of pro-German sentiments had centered on the Pope himself, who we see here, um, during the opening phase of the conflict, by the beginning of 1916, attention had shifted to Benedict's Bavarian Chamberlain, who we also see, Monsignor Rudolf von Gerlach. Rod was not alone in believing that Gerlach was a German agent though no conclusive evidence could be found. In January 1917, the Italian authorities escorted Gerlach to the border. He crossed into Switzerland and ceased to be their problem. He could hardly have been better connected, for not only had he ingratiated himself with the Pope, but his sister was lady-in-waiting to Zita of Bourbon Parma, whose husband, Karl, succeeded to the Austro-Hungarian throne in November 1916. Within months, this new emperor launched his own peace initiative. Uh, that was in February 1917. So just weeks after Gerlach was escorted to the border, keep remembering those dates. Uh, in February 1917, the em new emperor Karl uh, launched his own peace initiative independently of Austria's allies, by making an approach towards France. It was rebuffed by the French. On the 1st of August, 1917, so later the same year, Benedict issued his peace note. It reaffirmed his complete impartiality, his consistent championing of the greatest good, his commitment to finding a just and lasting peace. In the light of the Emperor's recent efforts, it is hardly surprising that Austria was the only one of the warring powers to take the Pope's statement seriously. The British press roundly dismissed it as the work of the man they had labelled as pro-German. Gasquet took personal issue with the Times correspondent Wickham Steed, but Gasquet was not the right man. He was a, his character was completely wrong for penning a thoughtful public analysis of the Pope's statement as a means of countering the press's antagonism. However, his sidekick at Downside, Abbot Ford, was precisely the man who could do that. And we've heard the, the 
the peace note was the 1st of August 1917. In three letters to the tablet, dated the 1st, 8th and 22nd of September, so just a few weeks later, Ford wrote on the subject of the Pope's peace note and his three letters to the tablet were subsequently published in pamphlet form. Ford had not, there, there's Gaskin and Ford together, you can see. Um, Ford had not been living quietly at Downside or even at Ealing all the time. He had been resident in Rome for part of that time from 1916 onwards. So he'd got his finger on the pulse and when Gasquet needed him, he was right there. He was staying with Gasquet at the Palazzo San Calisto for part of 1916. So all very timely. Now we know about his travels to Rome and elsewhere in the Mediterranean in the course of the war from Hicks's biography. But to that account, we can now add the passport issued to Ford in February 1915 and letters from the Foreign Office to smooth his journeys in that and the following year. Journeys that were to take him through France and Italy and potentially as far as Greece and Portugal. In the wake of the third tablet letter, so in 1917 now, Ford's correspondence mentions another visa for foreign travel. Now, you could only get visas for foreign travel for very serious purposes from the government, and here was a man whose talents could be usefully channeled by the British authorities. So his wartime travels were positively encouraged. Precisely how Ford, Ford served the war effort remains obscure, but there are hints among his papers. One such is a letter of the 30th of March 1918, sent from Casa Solitaria on the island of Capri. The writer, Captain Mackenzie, requests Captain Clarence, the railway transport officer at Modane, near the Franco-Italian border, to assist his friend, the Abbot of Glastonbury. In civilian life, Captain Mackenzie was the novelist and recent Catholic convert, Compton Mackenzie, mm -hmm. who so enjoyed his wartime role in the Eastern Mediterranean Special Intelligence Bureau that he could not resist publishing detailed memoirs that led to him being charged with breaking the Official Secrets Act. His revelations included the use made of the passport and visa sections of British embassies for intelligence work. Ford's densely stamped passports were processed by those very offices. In two other letters in Ford's uh, archive, uh, we find um, more hints about what was going on. Both are dated May the 6th, but without a year, and are signed by Algar Thorold. Uh, they were sent from the British mission of Allied propaganda located at Via Venti Settembre 30, 30, Rome. In one of them, Thorold expresses his sorrow at Ford's departure and states that he doesn't know how he and his colleagues will manage without him. He encloses further letters for the police at Le Havre and Southampton. The other surviving item is Thorold's recommendation to Captain Clarence at Modane, in which Ford is described as a member of my mission, with the instruction to help him at your frontier. A limited amount of light is shed on Thorold and his work in Rennell Rod's memoirs, where it is stated that after Italy entered the war in 1915, a small office of propaganda was organized in Rome by Mr. Algar Thorold, and the embassy was thus relieved of much direct correspondence. Um, Thorold was well connected. If I tell you that he was Algar Labouchere Thorold, um, it may indicate that you, he, his relationship to the liberal MP Henry Labouchere, they were, the MP was his uncle. But Thorold, for those of you who know your Anglican history, um, yes, was an Anglican family. And uh, Algar's father was Anthony Thorold, who ended his career as Bishop of Winchester. Algar was a Catholic convert whose interests had taken a decidedly Italianate turn. Uh, he published books on Catholic mysticism 
with special reference to Blessed Angela of Foligno, and also a volume of texts relating to Catherine of Siena. Like Mackenzie, he was a dabbler, an enthusiast, which gives some idea of how he threw himself into propaganda work. Ford was another man of broad interests, but the precise nature of his contribution to the Allied cause in Rome may never be known. Propaganda was one thing, diplomacy was another, and the Ford archive tells of his contacts with career diplomats going back some years. In 1903, for example, Father Basil Maturin wrote from St Mary's Cadogan Street, Chelsea, to tell Ford about a very nice fellow from the Foreign Office, the Honourable James Eric Drummond, who was in the process of converting to Catholicism prior to marriage, and who might benefit from a stay at Downside. The visit ensued, and Drummond's gratitude for Ford's hospitality is expressed in three further letters. The marriage linked Drummond, a Scottish aristocrat who inherited the Earldom of Perth in 1937, with the interrelated Catholic families of England, not least the Howards. But his uh, son, the future eighth Earl, was educated at Downside from 1916, suggesting that Ford and the community had made a positive and lasting impression. Between 1915 and 19, Drummond was principal private secretary to the foreign secretary, which meant successively Sir Edward Grey and then Arthur Balfour. Drummond's papers from that period are held in the National Archives and reveal how he put his acquired Catholic network to practical use in the context of war. Um, we can see examples of this coming from the United States, um, I won't go into those, but his sources were Monsignor Arthur Barnes, who until recently had been the Catholic chaplain at the University of Cambridge, and Shane Leslie, another downside parent and subsequently Gasquet's biographer. But basically, if you can imagine how Irish the American hierarchy was, it was a way of finding out uh, their attitudes towards Britain, and because their attitudes, their anti-British attitudes, could in influence American Catholics. In Europe, Drummond's network of informants included the paranoid Polish exile, Count Jan Horodyski, whose opinion was that Pope Benedict was so thoroughly pro-German that the real German Chancellor is Monsignor Pacelli, nuncio at Munich. Pacelli's movements were certainly tracked by the British. In the spring of 1918, he traveled from Munich through Switzerland down to Rome. And the British ambassador in Bern, Sir Horace Rumbold, reported on this. And then the British ambassador to the, uh, sorry, envoy to the Holy See, de Salis, endeavored to find out what Pacelli was doing in Rome, why he'd gone there. The harnessing of an international Catholic network for secular diplomatic purposes was exploited by Drummond, but it built on the existence of a Catholic mafia in the Foreign Office, associated with his predecessor, Sir William Tyrrell, who served as Gray's principal private secretary uh, up to 1915 and went on to head the political intelligence department. A case in point of this Catholic mafia is provided by one of Balfour's assistant private secretaries, Cecil Dormer, and we will come across him later. Um, there's a lot of useful marriages going on, not, uh, so uh, Drummond's was just only one, but marriage into noble or otherwise well-connected dynasties throughout Catholic Europe was one of the factors that made the diplomatic service a natural fit for members of Britain's Catholic elite. None were more cosmopolitan than the Actons, successive generations of that family producing a minister of the Neapolitan crown, a cardinal, and the celebrated historian, the last of whom was ennobled. The second Baron Acton, who we see here, uh, was a career diplomat who specialised in German and Swiss affairs. He was the second secretary at the British Embassy in Bern for the period that we are concerned with. By 1918, 
Drummond's interest in international Catholicism appeared to be paying off. On the 6th of May, de Salis reported that the Vatican seemed to be veering towards the Allies because the military party was in the ascendant in Prussia. Then at the height of summer, de Salis suffered, and I quote, a rather severe attack of this Spanish influenza, as they are calling it. And Drummond's attention moved from Rome to Bern, where Acton, the man, the, the only one of this lot who had a beard by the look of it, they, all the rest had moustaches, and you didn't get to see von Bulow, whose moustache was stupendous. Um, Burn, where Acton was feeling redundant, but was full of ideas. Our attention moves to Switzerland. Here be Switzerland. Bordering the central powers of Germany and Austria-Hungary, and also the allied states of France and Italy, Switzerland had remained in an uneasy state of armed neutrality throughout the previous four years of conflict, effectively paralyzed by the natural tendency of the country's German speakers to favor one side, while the French and Italian speaking minorities favored the other. Switzerland was also well placed to host interned sick prisoners from both sides. This work was managed by the Red Cross, it was bankrolled by the warring parties in a rare gesture of cooperation, and it was facilitated by the Catholic Church as a supranational body that could communicate with all parties. Switzerland became a nexus of diplomacy and espionage to the extent that members of the Italian military intelligence service managed to convince themselves that the papacy was secretly controlled from Switzerland by a committee consisting of the papal delegate there, the general of the Jesuits and the Bishop of Kerr. That may have been a far-fetched conspiracy theory, but Acton nevertheless saw potential in playing the Catholic card in Switzerland. And on the 25th of July, 1918, he wrote in confidence to Drummond uh, about how this Catholic dimension might be channeled. But though he stressed that he didn't want to flood the Swiss press with accounts of the patriotism of English Catholics. <laughs> By the 5th of August, his thoughts had turned to how the Archbishop of Munich had been in Switzerland on the pretext of visiting interned German soldiers, and how abortive efforts of the same kind had been considered with regard to possible visits by Cardinal Gasquet and Archbishop John McIntyre, rector of the English College in Rome. It wasn't much of a cover, Acton conceded, because there were few Catholics among the British internees. Though there were no more among the Germans, really. Nevertheless, Acton continued, Prussia's current anti-Catholic policy has, uh, has caused indignation in the Vatican, so Britain ought to capitalize on that. Drummond replied cautiously, uh, the idea of sending an English Catholic bishop to Switzerland on the pretext of visiting the interned, but in reality to preach there for propaganda purposes, would be too obvious. Though I think your suggestions with regard to capital being made out of Prussia's present anti-Catholic policy may be useful. Propaganda was one thing, but a targeted covert operation was also under serious consideration, as Acton mentioned on the 25th of July. It will be a good thing if we can realize our plan of posting an agent at Einsiedeln. Einsiedeln is what you have been looking at. Einsiedeln Abbey, the spiritual heart of Swiss Catholicism, traced its origins back to the ninth century and maintained a traditional emphasis on educational and pastoral work. Its mission extended as far afield as Indiana and North Dakota, where daughter houses put Einsiedeln at the forefront of the monastic colonization of the United States. The abbot of Einsiedeln from 1905 was Thomas Bossart, a theologian who had studied at the Gregorian University in Rome and spent time at St. Anselmo. According to the Abbey's historian, Bossart enjoyed a wider reputation than any of his predecessors. And um, 
we can re that reputation is reflected in the distinction of the guests who visited the Abbey. Um, yes. Pius X went there uh, when he was still a cardinal, he went incognito. Um, the two papal secretaries of state, Rampolla and Gaspari, also visited. Gibbons and Gasquet were among the prelates who made their way to Einsiedel. In 1913, Bossart's standing among his fellow abbots was acknowledged when he was appointed coadjutor with right of succession to the seriously ill abbot primate Hildebrand de Hemptine. In April and May that year, Bossart travelled to Malta for the International Eucharistic Congress and proceeded to Monte Cassino for the consecration of that abbey's crypt on the 6th of May. Six days later, he was unanimously proclaimed abbot primate by the, by the abbots of the order assembled in Rome, but declined the honour and was back at Einsiedeln five days later, leaving the primacy to Fidelis von Stotzingen, that friend of the Kaiser who was mentioned earlier. Cue the Kaiser. Einsiedeln's location made it an obvious staging post on journeys between Italy and Germany, between Papal Rome and the Berlin of Wilhelm II, who sent his portrait, not this one, to Abbot Bossart. Although the Emperor himself remained a devout Protestant, he was conscious of the need to cultivate his Catholic subjects, and no less conscious of the global significance of the papacy. In an act that anticipated Anglo-German rivalry over battleships, which you should know quite well, in 1903, he paid his own visit to Leo XIII, less than three weeks after that of his uncle, Edward VII. Now, we, if we're interested in English Catholic history, we know about that visit of Edward VII, but do we rarely stop to reflect that Wilhelm was there less than three weeks later. He wasn't going to be beaten by his uncle on anything. Now there was a Catholic branch of the Hohenzollern dynasty and that had an even firmer association with Einsiedel. One of its members, Ferdinand, was married to Princess Mary of Edinburgh, Edward VII's niece, and was King of Romania from 1914 to 1927. And in 1916, King Ferdinand sided with Britain, the land of his in-laws, against the central powers, which meant in due course that Romania's borders were expanded when the Austro-Hungarian Empire was broken up after the war. But there's more to it than that, because between 1896 and 1924, two successive archbishops of Bucharest were monks of Einsiedel. So we've already seen Einsiedel located on a north-south axis between Germany and Italy, but we can see it also on an east-west axis between Romania and Britain. So there you have it, Einsiedel, the crossroads of Europe. The outbreak of war in 1914 had relatively little impact on a monastery in neutral Switzerland. But that changed dramatically when Italy entered the conflict in May 1915. The Vatican itself remained neutral territory, but most of Rome was not, forcing the Germans of Sant'Anselmo and many other clerics to seek refuge elsewhere. The abbot primate of the Benedictines and his secretariat re-established their operations at Einsiedel as did the superior general of the Palatine order and members of the Greek college. And look at all those windows in that abbey. That's a lot of rooms. They can host an awful lot of guests, which is precisely what they did. Now, although the embassies from the central powers to the Holy See locate, relocated to Lugano, the Austrian, Bavarian and Prussian ambassadors were also among the Abbey's wartime guests, as was Bernhard von Bülow, whose mission to the Kingdom of Italy was necessarily suspended when Italy entered the war. When the notorious Monsignor Gerlach, 
was allowed to leave Italy in January, or strongly encouraged to leave Italy in January 1917, he too made his way to Einsiedeln. I told you to remember those dates because it was the very next month, February 1917, that the Emperor Karl made his uh, overtures towards the French. To the outside world, it created the impression that a monastery in neutral Switzerland was being used for clandestine purposes by the German-speaking Central Powers, and such suspicions were articulated in the Allied press. Einsiedeln was on the patch of Sir Horace Rumbold, uh, the um, British ambassador in Bern, who we see here, and he was fixated on what might or might not have taken place there. They're like going there. Uh, the, and then the emperor's uh, overtures issuing a few week, being issued a few weeks later. Rumbold was convinced there was a connection that all the key players had met at Einsiedeln early in 1917. It was not a fixation shared by de Salis in Rome, as he explained to Drummond at the Foreign Office. I cannot tell you how far the Vatican were aware at the time of the Emperor Charles' overtures to France in the earlier part of 1917. I do not think that the Emperor's letter was drawn up at Einsiedeln by the persons mentioned in Rumbold's telegram. De Salis, and here he is, returned to this theme a week later. I see that Rumbold still defends his source of information with regard to the meeting at Einsiedeln in February 1917 to draw up the Emperor Charles letter. The Vatican has, of course, officially denied through the Osservatore Romano that the Pope's peace note had any connection with the Emperor's letter. It was in the aftermath of this correspondence that de Salis contracted the Spanish flu and Drummond's attention was drawn to the ideas of Rumbold's deputy Acton for exploiting the potential offered by Catholicism in Switzerland, including the plan to get a British agent into the monastery at Einsiedel. The earliest surviving reference to Ford as the chosen agent comes in Acton's letter of the 25th of July but only to emphasise Acton's reservations, because he distrusted what he called Ford's ultramontanism, which presumably reflected the amount of time Ford spent in Rome, and here he is not in Rome but at nearby Grotta Ferrata, uh, rather than Ford's aversion to florid un-English forms of worship, for as we saw earlier, he was terribly, terribly English, apart from the Scottish uh, inheritance. Uh, that he got from one side of his family. Anyway, Acton's statement was, a, was one worthy of his father, the first Lord Acton, whose aversion to ultramontanism put him on a collision course with Cardinal Manning and other arch papalists. The younger Acton's inherited prejudice was, however, no match for the combination of Ford's long association with Drummond, of which we have heard, his new dealings with Mr. Thorold and Captain Mackenzie, in propaganda and so forth, and his recognized expertise on the peace note. But he had a more particular connection with Einsiedeln, for he had a Swiss friend, Aloise Maria Benziger, the Carmelite Bishop of Quillon in India. Uh, this be he. He was a native of the town of Einsiedeln. He was educated at the Abbey there and sought to maintain connections by urging Abbot Bossart to establish a man monastic foundation in Madras. And Steve actually reminded me the other day that Benziger was visiting Downside when Ford fell down a flight of steps. His life was despaired of, because as ever, you know, he's so delicate, but being Ford, he survived. Anyway, Ford was as perfect a fit as could be found for the intended mission. His monastic detractors had often accused him of being a schemer, but, and I quote, he knew exactly when to speak and when to keep silent, and that was essential for any player of the great game. The decision made, it fell to Cecil Dormer, Drummond's deputy, to organise the practicalities. I couldn't find a suitable image of Dormer, so the Foreign Office will have to suffice. 
On the 20th of August, Dormer recommended that the abbot take £25 for his expenses and ask for more later, rather than being advanced a larger sum, because giving refunds causes complications. Although the passport office had still not provided the necessary paperwork, you need not worry too much about difficulties in travelling, as we shall do our best to make your journey as, easily, as, as easy as possible. They say that in all the films, don't they? What a, what a Mr. Smooth. The smoothness of the journey was again emphasised five days later. Uh, Ford wasn't to worry about anything. It would all be sorted for him. By the end of the month, the passport was ready. A letter of introduction to Rumbold in Bern had been prepared and Ford was asked whether there were any papers he might wish to have forwarded in the diplomatic bags to Bern and Rome. The passport itself survives at downside, as do identical letters to Rumbold and his counterparts in Paris and Rome, which state that the abbot is proceeding to Switzerland and later to Italy for reasons connected with his health. Wink, wink, if you like. A covering letter explains that a cheque for £50 is enclosed, which Ford is advised to cash before departing. After purchasing his rail tickets, he should convert the remainder into circular notes or a letter of credit from Thomas Cook's. This was the very advice that Baedeker's guidebooks had been dispensing for years. The missive continues, Mr. Martin has provided a letter to the military permit authorities and made passport arrangements. Send papers via our bag in Rome and let us know when you are expect to arrive in Bern so that the ambassador can be informed. By mid-September, any hope of Ford's journey being imminent was frustrated by the Swiss border being closed. Um, in the meantime, he did receive, there was a, a general letter of recommendation issued uh, from Mr. Balfour, the Foreign Secretary, who will be grateful for facilities which it may be possible to afford the abbot on his journey. Ford took his responsibilities seriously, so much so that he started to keep a travel journal in which it is stated that he divided the month of September between London and Quar Abbey on the Isle of Wight. This is core and it's very nice. Um, and from there, he could easily get to Southampton for the Channel Crossing. His mission was evidently not entirely a secret one, for while he waited for the go-ahead, he was contacted by Miss Lawrence Alma Tadema, daughter of the painter of the same name, on behalf of the Polish Victims Relief Fund. She hoped to catch him before he left and asked him to draw attention to the plight of the Poles. Among her contacts in Britain's Polish community, she specifically mentions Mr. Gielgud, which presumably refers to Frank Gielgud, who you see here, whose devout Polish Catholic mother divided her time between Britain and Vevey in Switzerland. At that point, Frank's eldest son, Louis, was a member of the British military mission in Paris, so not far removed from the circles in which Ford was then moving. And you know who Frank's, go back, Steve, you know who Frank's youngest son was, and you can see the family resemblance. Now you can go forward. Thank you. Ford arrived in Paris on the 3rd of October. This is 1918, remember, so you know there's not much of this war left. He proceeded to Bern by way of Geneva, Lausanne and Freiburg. The story is picked up in Acton's dispatch of the 26th of October, which reports that Ford had arrived about a fortnight earlier and had had two meetings with Monsignor Malione, the papal representative, but no political conversation. I'll just give you an extract from the uh, dispatch. It was first suggested that he, Ford, should reside at the convent where the papal agent is living. 
This convent shelters several prelates of mutually hostile camps, including a French Monsignor who is attached to the French embassy here and a Bavarian prelate who is employed ostensibly on behalf of the Catholics interned among the German prisoners. The Frenchman and the German are on excellent terms and are neighbors at table but it was eventually decided that it would be undesirable, for various reasons, that Abbot Ford should join this festive board. The travel journal confirms his arrival in Bern on the 12th of October. A plan for him to lecture at Freiburg on the Pope's peace note had been abandoned because there were few English speakers among the students there. Ford's six-page memorandum is attached to Acton's letter. Though a draft of the text can also be found in the travel journal, which confirms his presence at Einsiedeln from the 17th to the 21st of October. These combined sources demonstrate the seriousness with which he undertook his mission, even if there is nothing startling in the content, content or in his analysis of what he encountered at Einsiedeln. In his account, we read of uh, his traveling companion for the last stage of his journey. That was the parish priest of uh, Winterthur, who explained to Ford that the area's German speaking population had a natural bias towards Germany in all things, though not the extent of wanting a German military victory. Ford's primary purpose at the Abbey was to discover the opinions of the abbot primate von Stotzingen, whom he had encountered at St. Anselmo before the war and considered very aggressively German. The, the journal confirms that they met four times. Upon renewing their acquaintance, Ford was still of the opinion that a thorough German feeling pervaded everything that Stotzingen did, but Ford was able to distinguish between Stotzingen's uh, enthusiasm for Austrian and Bavarian Catholicism on the one hand, and his disinterest in militant Pr Prussianism on the other. The visits of Bülow and Gerlach, which had drawn Allied attention to Einstein, seem to have been in connection with the abbot primate's ecclesiastical influence, Ford stated in his account. And he was convinced that any cabaling had ceased. Turning to his hosts, as far as he could see, Abbot Bossard appeared to take much satisfaction from the prospect of imminent Prussian humiliation. The community as a whole was strictly neutral, or at least outwardly so. Inwardly, Ford convinced himself, most of the monks harbored a preference for the Allies and regretted that their hospitality had been monopolized by Germans during the war years. At Ford's departure, his memorandum attests, the monks plied him with messages for Gasquet in Rome. Ending on a secular note, he reports that the German Consul General at Zurich had stated that the German Emperor was a broken man, given up to prayer, and was unlikely to be succeeded by any of his sons. It was not the most revealing of insights for the Kaiser abdicated less than three weeks later and, of course, was not succeeded by any of his sons. In his covering letter, Acton draws Drummond's attention to Ford's remarks about Stotzingen and the community's sentiments before expressing regret that the visit had been so short. Of course, his presence in Switzerland cannot be compared with the more permanent political clerical activities of the French and Bavarian prelates whom I have mentioned above. But at this stage of the war, perhaps we have not lost much by this disadvantage. Acton then explains that uh, Ford had gone on to visit three of the internment camps. Now, all of this can be picked up in Ford's uh, archive as well. Uh, we know from his journal that he was back in Bern from the 23rd to the 25th of October, when his report must have been typed up. He returned to Freiburg for two days and then stopped even more briefly at Vevey. The no mention is made of him visiting Madame Gielgud. Uh, so we don't know whether, whether he did anything on behalf of the Poles at all. 
Ford's archive does contain a letter from the chaplain at one of the internment camps dated the 17th of October, inviting him to visit the camp and the journal confirms his presence there 12 days later. This was the chaplain, at least in later life, for it was Dom John Chapman, a monk of Merit Zoo in Belgium, who officially transferred to Downside in 1919, so not much after the present period that we're talking about, and was elected Downside's fourth abbot, as you can see here, a decade later. The clandestine and pastoral elements of his expedition complete, Ford was keen to escape the rigours of the Alpine winter and proceed to Rome. Though there were also exceptional circumstances that made flight from Switzerland a sensible precaution, for the Spanish flu had reached that region, and deteriorating economic conditions led to a general strike in, in November 1918. Before the Foreign Office could decide what further use was to be made of Ford, there were loose ends to be tied up. Dormer wrote again on the 6th of December, replying to Ford's five days earlier, your visit to Einsiedeln seems to have been valuable, and we are most grateful to you for making the visit and for the report which you have been so good as to furnish. Then comes an admonition from a career diplomat to a novice agent. Your letter, I see, was sent through the ordinary post and was opened by the Italian censor, which was unfortunate. I think perhaps it would be better if you write about Einsiedeln or similar matters again to send it in the Vatican mission bag. Ford was on safer ground with his meticulous financial records, which can be seen in the journal. Dormer wrote again, asking him to kindly send a cheque for six pounds, one shilling and five pence, the unspent portion of his advance. Whatever the man of God's strengths and weaknesses as an agent in the field, the Foreign Office had its finger on the Central European pulse when it sent Ford to Einsiedeln. In late March 1919, the Austrian Emperor was forced into a reluctant exile in Switzerland, taking his wife and family with him. The Emperor and Empress are seen here kneeling on a railway track, hearing mass. Uh, maybe this was the very time when they were going into exile. Um, their first Swiss residence was at a place where the monks of Einsiedeln had teaching responsibilities, and both the emperor and empress paid visits to and otherwise retained connections with the monastery itself, though they established a more permanent residence on the shores of Lake Geneva. The Ford archive then fades away, offering only sporadic hints at his later, at his later interests in public affairs. On the 3rd of April 1919, a note was made on his passport to the effect that he was leaving Rome and proceeding to London on business of the Benedictine order. The Paris Peace Conference had opened in January and was in progress when he broke his journey in the French capital. The British Embassy there issued him with a letter requesting assistance for the remainder of his journey. In contrast to the passport, it explains that he has been on, a, on an official mission for the Foreign Office and is signed John de Salis. For the avoidance of confusion, this was Captain de Salis of the Parisian Embassy, not the eponymous Count who remained in Rome. By October 1921, another expedition was in the offing, this time Lord Curzon, who had succeeded Balfour as Foreign Secretary, was requesting any facilities which it may be possible to give the abbot, though no light is shed on why Ford was proceeding abroad or the reason for such high level support. There is nothing further in the, connect the collection until a note of thanks to Ford for his letter to the Prime Minister. The time of writing in 1924, meant that that was Stanley Baldwin. Although Ford's brief mission to Einsiedeln came too late to make any impact on the course of the war, some of the figures connected with it were subsequently linked to one another in the quest for a lasting peace, specifically by means of the League of Nations. Drummond uh, was the League's first Secretary General. Monsignor Malione stayed on in Switzerland as Papal Nuncio and Provisional and papal envoy to the Geneva-based League. And in 1924, Ford 
published his response to the League by reflecting on the legal claims uh, made to underpin its legitimacy. Um, his thoughts were first published in the Dublin Review and later appeared in pamphlet form. Meanwhile, between 1918 and 1924, Compton Mackenzie published no less than 10 novels. One of them, The Heavenly Ladder, consists of 300 pages set in Cornwall, a few on the Western Front, and a somewhat incongruous conclusion in which his hero suddenly finds himself in Switzerland, where he meets a Benedictine monk, the titular abbot of some famous and noble foundation long ruined, Glastonbury. This beautiful and dignified old man speaks prophetically about any League of Nations that refuses to admit the vanquished to its councils, but nevertheless prays for God's blessing on it, for anything that tends, however ineffectively, towards the unity of the human race will help the hearts of men to desire that perfect unity in which Catholics recognize the only possible future, institutionally speaking, for the world. This is surely an affectionate portrait of Abbot Ford, lifelong preacher of peace, inveterate traveler, and we now know, fairly secret agent for the British government. Thank you. <laughs>